having watched a bunch of different videos from different video blogger people or whatever they're called, I've discovered that they often thank everybody who is viewing, which I don't seem to do. Seems to be a lapse. Not sure how consistently I'll do this, but this time, thank you to all of you for your continued support. And I greatly appreciate it. Cannot do it without you. This is not sarcastic. All of that is true. But I'm not quite sure how to say it without it just sounding like pro forma. Well, it's not. I do thank you. To continue with question and answer number 10, which begins uh, with a question from Manu. Specifically, what is the purpose of a relationship map for a GM? And what's the best way, or at least a good way, to use one? I'll twist the question a little bit. Um, here, I am going to refer to the term relationship map as used by me as a specific component of the supplement, The Sorcerer's Soul. It is not presented in any other context. The extent to which it might be adapted to any other context is fine. Um, I think it applies well for a number of different games or play circumstances, but that's not what I'm talking about. So any and all application elsewhere is off the table for what I'm talking about. So it's a non-general question answer. Um, well. What we're talking about in that case is very, very specific. It is a set of circles and arrows with people in them or entities or what have you um, who are connected by ties of kinship or sexual contact. Now, there may be this or that small exception for one or another reason, but the default is to set it up that way. And definitely not to grade into this person knows that person and not to grade into any historical things like this person killed that one. Such other annotations might be added as a form of notes, but the diagram itself is about kinship, sexual contact degrees of either you know as you see fit now with that stated the issue here first is what on earth is this for what context was i talking about in this case i'm talking about playing sorcerer with a smidgen of extra attention toward humanity. And let's, before we go off into the rabbit hole of humanity definitions, which I have finally decided was sort of a very secondary emphasis, let's stick with their four issues of empathy and morality. What's also nice about this is that we don't dive into the setting and say, okay, so what's moral to the people of this setting? I don't care. I'm talking about us. And in Sorcerer, judging the moments for humanity checks or gains on the basis of ethics and morality is one person's job. You're, you're subject in playing Sorcerer. You are subject to that person. In fact, it's a good way of realizing that they are exposing themselves, uh, the aspects of themselves to you that they may actually not be fully uh, willing or as open about as they would be in some other circumstance. All right, so we're playing Sorcerer. We're using Humanity Checks and Gains, which are part of the default rules. And in this case, there is perhaps some attention to that content, the role of those things in play. Now, 
all that stand. What good is such a diagram? And in that context, I keep saying that maybe we should just have a great big sign over me for this entire thing. In that context, what I mean is that backstory often plays a role in situations with that kind of content. So backstory meaning who has done what to whom already and what generational effects perhaps may be involved. And I am also talking about backstory insofar as it continues to inform people's or entities' choices now. That's, I think, the most critical point of this entire answer. When backstory informs how characters may act or what they are taking into account when they act. In its crudest form, you could say it is a reference point for being able to play a non-player character, if we're talking about a game master in Sorcerer, without reference to what it will do next. Without reference to, when I say next, I mean like next to next, in a little while. So if I do this, how will the story go? If I do this, will the players be more excited? If I do this, how is this going to go now? If I do this, I will make a better story. It's on me to make a better story. I'm saying throwing all of that out. Removing the next 10 seconds of play from your mind. Removing the next scene of play from your mind. What does this non-player character, which includes demons in many cases, going to do? It may be something that they're doing without anybody looking. It may be something that they're doing right there in the middle of play. The point is that they do it. And especially in reference to a recent game of Sorcerer in which I played a character, the ability to do this is primary for that game to play non-player characters of all types and kinds without reference to, is this going to be fun? Is this the right thing to do? Is this going to make a better story? When one thinks like that, and I'm thinking about a specific incident, actually, recently, when one thinks like that, the decisions one makes actually tend to have the opposite effect. You get... Uh, I don't know, spaghetti throwing behavior um, on the part of all the NPCs. They they're just do wild things and they do dramatic things or they do shocking things or they get super, you know, the, the other way around. They get super, super, super secret and won't tell you or do anything. And Anyway, I think that there's a, an important counterintuitive insight here. When, as a sorcerer game master, you are looking ahead to see and thinking about how good this is going to be, how much sense it's going to make, how revelatory it's going to be, how great this would be if they did this, that's a bad idea. It actually has exactly the opposite effect on play. Instead, if you play the entities and people according to a completely different logic, then play becomes vastly, vastly more exciting and fun for everyone. Not because it becomes weirder and more random and whatever, but exactly the opposite. In retrospect, it actually becomes vastly more coherent. What does this relationship map have to do with it? It's providing a reference point, uh, assuming that the non-player character or entity knows some of it, if not all of it, some to all of it. These are reference points for what kinds of priorities crowd into their thinking. Whatever it is that they want, whatever it is they have been trying to conceal, whatever it is they are trying to reveal, whatever it is they're trying to harm, or whatever it is they're trying to protect. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Whatever it is that they're about, or think they're about, 
needs reference. They're in, they are playing, you are playing them. They are in this moment of play and you say, what are they thinking? And you're not looking ahead to what the impact of that action is going to be on anyone else in terms of their emotional engagement with play. No, you are instead thinking fictionally, what are they up to? What are they about? Here we run into a couple of problems. One is the notion that an NPC is sort of a one-note Johnny and just does this thing, and that's their role in the story, and they will continue to do this thing, and that should be the case no matter what, whether they are the axe murderer or whether they are the funny secretary or whatever other, you know, B-movie part you have, have assigned to them, and you're just ready to, you know, deliver that thing for them all the way through Plague, because that's your job, is to be that character actor for them. I'm suggesting otherwise. I'm suggesting that, to some extent, non-player characters and entities are flexible, that they can change their minds, that they can uh, prioritize, that they can do any number of things. And when they don't, it should be thought of in light of, well, they could have. So flexibility doesn't mean they change all the time. It means like, you know, silly putty or whatever. It means that the potential to change is there and that they don't in some cases. So how do you play them? What do you do? If you're not, you know, thinking in terms of the story and how good this is going to be, what on earth can you be referencing? You can reference, okay, they want this, but that's that whole sort of, you know, one note, you know, robotic, this character does that, this character acts like that kind of play. Instead, you say, what would they be referencing? Referencing that particular set of information that I mentioned is remarkably powerful toward that end. It may mean they go ahead and do the same thing they've been doing. It may mean that they don't. You will, of course, have to arrive at that yourself, but looking at that and saying, okay, so he's his brother and that happened, just keeping that backstory powerful in your mind is very, very effective. 